Now, I'm, I'm now recording. We are now being recorded. So uh, welcome to the very first lecture of production design and art direction. So this is, this is pretty exciting. So I'm just going to um, just check that things are working first before we go too far ahead. And already I can see that my slides are not progressing. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to try a trick that Simon told me to do a new okay. share and just see if that works, just if I refresh it. Well, boom, that should be the same slide, and it's still the same slide, and it's not working. Okay, that's um, interesting. Dun, dun, dun. I'll try yet again. Ah, wait a minute. I think this is the one that I'm supposed to be looking at. There's a couple of different windows. Now, just tell me... Aha. Has the yes, slide changed for you guys? Agenda. Agenda. We have an agenda. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> okay. Now, I like to just start off um, with any, any sort of teaching thing, just to sort of uh, tell you what the purpose of the lecture is. So what are we going to, what are you going to know at the end of this? Uh, why are we doing it? All that sort of stuff. So we're going to talk about why you're doing this subject, uh, what we're going to be uh, covering in it. So we're going to talk about the content. We're going to talk about... Uh, just a brief recap of some of my experiences just to let you know what I'm bringing to the table uh, and how it fits into the, the grand plan. So that's the grand plan of the, uh, the course, um, the academic outcomes and all that sort of stuff, but also your journey and where you're going. And uh, maybe there's something within this subject that you want to specialise in and that's, um, uh, that's something that we, we can talk about. Uh, we'll be talking about what's required of you, which is doing the assessments. Um, with regards with regards to to that, what's required of you? Um, we were talking about this before uh, that you're required to do an extra six hours a week per subject, and um, that is a that is a big ask. And I I, I totally totally get it. Uh, having done a part time masters, uh, it's 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 a pretty heavy workload. Um, but look, really, there's three A's that I reckon are the are the formula for success. With, um, uh, with with learning, uh, and that's if you if, first of all you got to, you need to attend. So that means you need to either you know come along like you've done tonight, or get a hold of the lecture and have a read of it and engage with it. Um, you need to do the assessments. If you don't do the assessments, um, you know you're not adding to your folio, you're not adding to your knowledge, and and you could run the risk of failing and having to repeat. Um, and just a bit of application. And that really comes into using those six hours that you've got. And how you do that is up to you, your time management, you're all busy people, uh, you're taking on this, this, uh, this courageous uh, new, new journey in, in your life. And that's really, that's really important. So and, and just to reiterate what Simon was saying last night about doing, doing something every day. And I think that's really important, even if you're just getting, you know, a half an hour each day, that, that chews up a couple of hours pretty quickly. And then on the weekend, maybe you can, you can do a bigger, um, you know, do a few hours in a row. If you leave, if you leave your, all of your work until one, one day or one evening, you know where that leads. You've, you've done enough uh, study to, to realise that. So that's what's required of you. Um, if you do that, I don't think you'll have any problems. Um, and, of course, we're here, here to help you any time. So the anticipated skill sets, um, that's got to do with, um, really it's about production planning and we'll talk about, you know, we've got a whole lecture to go through. Um, so the skill sets will uh, include things like, I don't know how much or whether any of you are very keen on drawing, um, but drawing is super important. Uh, we, you don't have a, a drawing unit as such, but I think we can sneak um, some into here and you will be required Yay. To do some artwork good <laughs> this <laughs> is good all work. good news that's great <laughs> that's really good to hear um, because I love drawing I'm really passionate about it um, and uh, you know uh, I'm sort of going forwards and backwards here a little bit but um, I'll, I'll come back to that in a sec. But I just want to explain, there's going to be a little bit of overlap between subjects. 
and that's that's not a bad thing that means that there's continuity if you do if you sort of silo the subjects too much then they don't really relate to each other so there are going to be times when you go hang on you know when you're doing the storyboarding unit you know you're going to say no tony's already told us about gesture and thumb knowing that but it doesn't hurt to do it again um, and that's what it is uh, all about is it's learning but you also need to practice these skills to get good at them and ultimately have a good portfolio um, just to give you a quick rundown of, of, um, of my history, of course, you know that um, Simon's a, a good mate of mine and we, we started working together, I think it was in 1991, something like that. Um, and we've been pretty good mates ever since and we seem to always end up working at the same place. And this has happened probably, I think I counted the eight jobs that we've ended up working together. Uh, at these different different places. So I started off in 2D animation uh, back in the uh, late 80s, uh, about 87, 88, working at Hanna-Barbera's in Sydney. And um, it, it was funny because I actually studied science. I did a, um, a degree in marine biology and zoology. So I was not really thinking I'd ever end up as a professional artist. And um, it was really just a, a, a fluke chance that gave me that opportunity. And um, I found out a, a, an old school friend was working at Hanna-Barbera as an animation checker. So I got in contact with her and said, look, you know, I'd love to come and um, do a drawing test. I thought I was pretty, pretty hot with a, with a pencil. Um, long story short, I went in and did my test and uh, completely failed it. So I was devastated. I was working as a lab technician at the time using my wonderful science degree. And um, it really, really affected me. And I thought, ah, look, I don't want to, I don't, I'm not going to give up on this because when I did the test, I remember walking into the studio in, in North Sydney and there was this incredible vibe and there were creative people everywhere. Everyone was rushing about, people were drawing furiously. Um, there was the sound of electric pencil sharpness going off everywhere. And everyone did, was just, the place was just decorated in drawings um, and people and sketches and caricatures of each other. And it was just a, a really amazing uh, environment. If you ever look up any photographs of old animation studios and stuff, you'll see, you'll see what I mean. It's very different to the computer-based world we live in now. And I was, I was just totally addicted by it. And so two months later, I went, okay, I'm going to go, I want, to, I, want, I want this, I really want to do it. So I rang my friend up and said, look, I want to have another crack at this. And she said, look, we're all full up, we're fully crewed, we, we, we don't have any space. And so I pleaded with her and I bribed her with a packet of Tim Tams and she had a, a chat with the, the, new, the new boss, the, the person who had tested me had since left, a new guy was there. And so two months later, she said, okay, I've got you this this interview and now I know I owe this guy a favour so thanks very much. I went in there and I had some drawings with me and in, the, in those two months after my first failure I got some model sheets from the production they were working on, I did some research and I drew those characters and I just kept drawing them and drawing them and drawing them and, and cleaned them up and I built myself a little light box and uh, I took them in and this guy was sitting there and he said oh okay okay we'll, we'll do a drawing test but what have you got there? You've got some drawings. I said yeah, okay, I've got some drawings. And he had a look through it. He went, okay, well, can you start in three weeks? And I was like, shit. Um, you know, all of a sudden, here I am. I was employed as a professional artist. Um, and I was, totally, uh, I was totally hooked from that point on. And um, the reason I'm telling you that story is you need to have some failures sometimes. And I could have easily not gone ahead with it. And I think I would have regretted it all my life. So that was that was my story of how I got into animation and I just absolutely love it. And, you know, as a coincidence, I end up sharing a, a house with one of my workmates and he was a painter and he just set up his easel in the kitchen one day and started painting. I thought, oh, I'd like to have a go at that. He said, well, why don't you? And I started painting and, you know, to this day I, st I have exhibitions as well. So um, I've, I've kept painting and drawing, you know, for the last, you know, 30, 30 so or so years. And um, it's just been a wonderful gift and, um, you know, a gift to me and a, a privilege to be able to work in that industry and, and meet so many wonderful people. Um, long story short, after, after that finished, I went overseas and, and worked uh, for about four and a half five years in, in feature films and, and TV, uh, TV series, 
working on features was where I met Simon. Uh, we met on a production called FRO7. Um, I think it went straight to video in those days. Uh, we used to call it FRO Up. But um, it was great because of the people that were there and, and Simon was one of those people. And then eventually we went off in different directions and then ended up coming back again and working on Balto, uh, which was uh, one of, it's probably the, um, I was yeah, really lucky to get a job there and um, it's just, uh, that was probably the, the production that I, I'm probably most proud of, I think. Um, it was just, uh, it was just amazing and uh, a really, really, really good experience. And that was where I got the, the, the taste for um, working in, uh, you know, production design. Um, it was, you know, it was pretty gruelling and you used to get paid footage rates, so you really get paid, you know, per how many drawings you do a day kind of thing. So it was almost like a, a, a sweatshop, but it was a very fun sweatshop. Um, so that... Um, <laughs> So I, I just thought of a, a funny story about Simon, which, which I, <laughs> I won't share with you. But um, so working, uh, working over there, that got, got me into, I got very interested in, in layouts, which was really sort of um, scene planning and sort of directing on a sort of a shot by shot basis. So a layout, layout artist, as opposed to an animator, you would be doing, you you'd do an animation layout, you would do a background layout, you would draw overlays and underlays, and you'd put it all together. Um, so that the animator would be able to start straight away um, and know exactly what was required of them. The background artists would know exactly what's going to happen in terms of action so that they could account for that when they're painting the background. You need to think about staging things like this when you're doing backgrounds. We'll get into this in much more detail later. Anyway, I came back to Australia. Um, sure enough, Simon beat me back to Australia. Um, he was English but always wanted to live here. And uh, there was a, a call saying, um, you know, there's a job here in Melbourne if you want it. So I came down and worked on the Silver Brumby uh, with Simon for a couple of years. And then we both ended up working in games, strangely enough. So I found myself at age 33 learning how to use a computer for the very first time and learning 3D at the same time. So that was uh, the very first version of 3DS Max it was um, the first 3D software. That, uh, that we used and um, that was a different a whole different experience which I really uh, appreciate as well as getting exposed to that after leaving uh, games I did a stint working for uh, film Victoria and I was lucky to have a position where I was uh, the animation officer there so I got to support animation projects and one of the best things that we did was um, you know, we had this four-day audition of animators and, and small teams uh, to make film clips for uh, Triple J Unearthed bands um, to be played on Rage. So that was that was super fantastic. And that was, um, I think, Sarah Blasco um, Sophie Coe were two of the names that I remember. And that was before they were really, you know, before they'd made, um, well, any other film clips. I guess they had an animated film clip made for them. Um, and that was really cool because I got to act as a producer on, on those. Um, so that's, that's, that's really fun is when you see something that you've worked on come on screen, it is, um, it, it, it's a real blast. And you, you'll, you'll know what I mean because it'll happen to you one day as well. Um, but when you're late at night when you're watching Rage and you see a film clip that you've been involved in come on, it's, uh, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty good. Um, so anyway, enough about me. Um, I'm just going to make sure that this is working. Um, did you see the slide change, everyone? Uh, yeah. yeah. Cool, yeah. cool, cool, cool. Um, so we'll get through this. This this is all pretty dry stuff at the beginning. What you're here to do. Uh, this this unit is really an introduction to do to pro production design and art direction. I'll explain the roles. Um, how they're different and also how they're similar a bit later. But I wanted to, st and I put in bold here, it's really about the creative methods used to develop animated outcomes, which really comes down to storytelling. It's all about the story um, and it's about visual storytelling. And that's, you should really think of yourselves as professionals in training rather than as students, because that's what you're doing. You're doing something pretty specific and you know what you want. Um, and you're, you're going to be storytellers and artists, and this is this is pretty exciting. So I'm actually quite excited for you. Uh, when I started out, there was no animation college at all. Uh, you had to actually do an, 
you know, an apprenticeship virtually at a, a, at a studio. So this is really, um, really what it's all about is, is these creative methods and to develop in a broader sense your creativity as well. And each one of you will have a story in you that is different to everybody else. And that's what I would really like to encourage is for you to tell your own stories. Okie dokie. Now, we have to unfortunately do um, assessments. Um, it would be nice if we could just chat and um, you know shoot the breeze and uh, basically just uh, maybe work on a couple of projects or something. Uh, but we have to satisfy the academic rigor of doing a degree and that involves doing assessments, of course, okay? So what I've done, I hope this is okay with you, but I took the essay out. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Good. I thought you'd be okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're going to do is something that's like a visual essay. And what I've called it is a blue sky mood board. Okay. So what we're going to do is you're going to do some research and you're going to find images that really just, just talk to you and you uh, are inspired by. Inspiration is so important. Uh, you're going to get these images together and you're going to come up with something, just a short brief and say, uh, and it, it's a mock brief. We're not actually going to make the project, but we're going to do the, the research stage and then the next two assessments in this uh, subject will build on that. I believe in having iterative um, assessments so that basically you're building on something and then you've got something at the end of it that you could potentially put in your folio rather than doing, you know, an essay about the, the history of visual effects and production design and art direction. You, you could easily do that. Um, but there's so much information out there existing. I think it's much better to do something a bit more practical. And you are visual people. So uh, we'll go through this uh, a bit more detail next week. Um, but basically, uh, the thing I wanted to stress probably was the idea of using... Um, out of the ordinary sources for inspiration. And by that I mean real life, weird seed pods you find in the garden, um, you know, anything, you know, the shape of a, of a mouse or an object that you're particularly fond of. You know, there's all, there's inspiration and reference all around us. We don't have to necessarily go online and, uh, you know, you tend to see the same stuff over and over again. Um, and it's always, you know, we tend to go for the big budget, uh, series or features like Game of Thrones or, or whatever or, or Ragnarok or whatever it is that you're, that you're into or Godzilla, which we're going to see this week. Um, but I, I really urge you to look at life and look at the things around you for inspiration. There was a concept artist, um, Feng Shui is one of my favourite concept artists, and he was saying one of his biggest sources of inspiration is just going for a walk in the garden or in, in, in you know, the forest, we'd say in the bush. Go for a walk in the bush, look, look at a, um, a Banksia cone that is half opened and, and you see like a tiny apartment building for, for weird creatures or something. When you're in the supermarket, you know, I, I get in trouble all the time because I'll find a, a, you know, a piece of garlic that looks like a little old man or something like that and I'll start playing with it. Um, look at things a little bit differently and that is the key, I think, to creativity is that you look at the world a little bit differently. Um, and that's what I want to see here, is I want to see what makes you tick and what makes you um, inspired. So let's, let's uh, we'll talk again about that next week. So what you'll be doing is you'll be providing a, um, basically a PDF of images with some notes on it and then a little, a little brief. And I've said half page, but, you know, a paragraph is fine. And you might say this um, uh, Blue Sky Mood Board is for a short animation about the life of, a honey ant or you know, something or what it doesn't have to be an epic and what I, I constantly have to come back to with the students and, and uh, oh I, I forgot to mention I, I did teach animation I was head of animation at uh, a competitor for 10 years before um, having two years off to do painting and exhibitions and stuff so I also have 10 years of um, tertiary um, education experience um, anyway um, so I want you to do, do the, the visual, come up with a, with a small um, uh, essay, or not an essay, just a paragraph about what your project to be. Do not make it an epic. 
do not do not say it's about a young man who returns to his village and finds that his whole family is dead and then he has to fight an army because if you uh, if you think of this as a as a warm up or a, or a uh, a run up to the final project that you'll be doing later on in your course we will probably be um will definitely be insisting that you do something quite small and contained um there's a there's a a thing called feature creep which you may have heard of uh, which means that gradually over the course of a project, all of these different features creep in and all of a sudden you've got this massive thing that just becomes a big stress. So keeping, keeping something simple and doing it well will get you, get you better results in a course like this than trying to do something that's too ambitious. Um, so that's something just to keep in mind. But this, this is something that we'll deal with on a, on a sort of a weekly basis as we talk about. So we'll just briefly talk about the next two... Um, assessments so the first assessments during week four they're, they're staggered so that you don't have i don't think you have anything else during that week um but basically for the next the next assessment which is during week eight you'll be fleshing out the work that you've already done okay and basically um this is going to be um an experimental thing but uh you will each give a short 10 minute presentation uh on a polished version of uh your idea Okay, so we'll come back to this and talk about it a bit a bit later. Um, I want it to be fairly informal, and uh, we'll get a we'll get a hard copy of it as well. Um, so it's really nothing to stress about. It's um, it's quite a small cohort. You you're all quite friendly people. I think it's a good um, a really good platform to start. Um, uh, you know, trying to do a bit of. Um, um, yeah, a bit of public speaking, a bit of presentation techniques and getting some experience doing that as well. Um, and you can think of it as well, you might uh, think of it as, as like an interview technique or something like that. So you might do an interview over Skype or something like that. So it can just be, you know, if you think, think of it as practice that's helping you build that skill set that we're talking about. Okay, so um, we... 12 is when your final assessment is due, and that is basically a, a folio of work developed from the previous uh, assessment. We'll be working on this together, and I would expect that I'd be getting emails to and fro from people saying, is this going the right way? Am I doing the right thing or whatever? More than happy to, to do that sort of thing. So it's basically just a more polished version of the previous assessment. So you see, we were going from research to a, um, a sort of a semi uh, presentation of what you have so far. This is where I'm at. And then the last thing will be the design portfolio. Okay. So we'll, we'll uh, um, basically next week, we'll talk more in depth about the first assessment. And you'll see when we come to the, the section that talks about what we're doing each week, I like to uh, go back over the assessments again during the course, just to make sure that everyone's, everyone's on track. Okay. Um, so, can I ask a question, please? Oh, yes. Of course, anyone just, wants to ask a question at any time. Sorry, just about the assessment real quick. Um, yep. Does it have to be, like, cartoon, like, focused, or can it be live action focused? It could be anything you like, want. So, okay, cool. So, okay. I just saw Blue Sky, and I was like, that's a <laughs> – they do cartoon. Okay. <laughs> what I mean by that is like um, uh, sky's the limit. Right. So okay. Your research can totally be. It could be all based in live action. Okay. Cool. Is that what you mean? The research part of it? No, I just mean in general. Like um, overall, like does our I don't know. I don't really know how to work with this. Okay. Does our uh, the idea, idea is that is to be like animated or live action. Okay, um, because you're doing an animation course, I would, I would expect that it would be either animated or live action with a lot of um, visual effects because that's what, that's what you're studying. Right. If it was just a filmmaking yeah. course, of course, we'd just, uh, it would be, be live action. But look, um, this is where it actually gets very interesting. I'm glad you brought this up because there's so much blurring of the lines between live action, animation, visual effects, and when it works well, you can't tell the difference. As, as you know, when you're watching some movies and then you find out, oh, that character was CG, I had no idea. You know, Gollum, yeah. oh, wow, I thought he was real. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it all blurs together. So, yes, absolutely, if you want to do something live action, as long as it has, you know, the visual effects and animation component in it, 
So what you, you, you know, just throwing a, a crazy idea out there is a live action film, but one of the, anima- one of the characters is animated. Yeah. Um, why not, you know? Yeah, go for it. Yep. A superhero. Hold on. A superhero. <laughs> well, or a super anti-hero. <laughs> That's good, yeah. Think outside the box. I really, I really like that stuff. Okay. Any more, any more questions about the assessments? So at the end of week 12 with the um, design portfolio, would that include the first assignment, like inspirations as well? Or like, uh, probably, could we add that in? Yeah, probably. Uh, well, if you were creating something in the first uh, part, well, actually, I'd rather you didn't. And I'll tell you why. Uh, there is a rule in higher education that you, you, you don't resubmit things that you've produced earlier in the course. I don't know if it's the same in uh, Victoria as it is in, in Queensland, but it's also a good excuse to tell people to do something new. Um, so I would expect to see a development of it. It could be totally based on what you've done in the first assessment. And I would expect to see, pardon me, <coughs> a continuity between the first assessment, the second assessment, and the third assessment. Because what you're doing actually is like a mini pipeline. This is what we're heading at. It's sort of like you're going to do a little pipeline without really realising it uh, just for the, the production design section. Um, so I wouldn't stress too much about it. And like I, like I say, we'll talk more about those assessments uh, in subsequent weeks just to clarify that everyone's on the same page. Really, this is just an introductory lecture just to let you know what, what's coming up. Does that sort of help you, Tom? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Okay, good. And also, at any time, you can send it to me and go, am I on the right you know, on, on the right path here, and then I can give you some feedback. So that, that's no drama. Okie dokie. So, yes, Leon. With the um, second sem- um, assignment, would that mm-hmm. be like a live um, presentation? Uh, just like we're doing now. So basically, I would... Oh, look, I don't know if you would even need... I'd have to talk to someone about the, uh, the technical side of it. Um, it would be live to the group. Um, alternatively, um, I totally understand if, if people, um, you know, would rather pre-record something. That might be an option as well, because this is online. This is um, this is a brave new world. I'm happy to I'm happy to float anything actually. If you would rather do that, maybe you could actually record a ten minute presentation. And I could assess it. Um, I, I would encourage you to to um, try the the live thing, providing that we could do it. I'm just assuming that I could throw to you guys one by one and get you to kind of just take over the meeting for, for 10 minutes. In a, in oh, a yeah, sense. Then. I, I don't then know we if that's... share our screen. Yeah, I think so. To be I fair, think... we all tell each other about our assignments anyway. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> That'll be all like, It shouldn't be like nerve wracking to anyone because we've already uh, well, all know what everyone's <clears throat> got. <laughs> so much better than sitting in front of, uh, standing in front of a classroom. <laughs> Absolutely, and especially if you've got a classroom with 35 people in it, it is nerve-wracking. Um, and, and, yeah, I had to do that with my master's as well. So, you know, I, I, I totally get it. But, you know, it's going to be pretty low stress. Um, it's a really nice cohort, um, and you guys sort of know, know each other pretty well. So, yeah, I think, I think it actually would be quite fun. Um, and it's, it's, um, I'm really glad to hear that you talk to each other about your assignments because... Peer learning is one of the things that isn't acknowledged often enough in education, that you guys learn a lot from each other. Um, and it's like, oh, God, how do I get this thing? Where's my, where's my gizmo gone in 3D? And someone goes, well, you just hit the X key or whatever. You know, these things happen all the time. And I learn stuff from you too. I always learn from my students. I always find out about some movie that I haven't seen or, um, you know, it, today I sent Simon a couple of things that he hadn't seen before and, it's just it's just great to share. Sharing is, is is wonderful and it makes you feel good and it is the best way to learn, I think, rather than just me going blah 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 and um and you trying to memorize it. That's just that's kind of pointless. It's it's more engaging this way, I think. Um any more uh, questions about uh, that sort of thing, the assessments? Are we all good? I've got I'm I'm just wondering like I've because I've already got I've got two ideas and I can't decide. <laughs> Um, I thought this might happen. <laughs> what I'll do is I'll get you to shoot me an email with a, Simon, it's one sentence. One sentence. 
describing each idea. One tent, all right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because that will be the equivalent of what we call a lift pitch. Has anyone heard that term before? No. 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 Lift or left? Lift. lift. If, I was, if I was a New Zealander, it would be very hard to tell the difference. But... <laughs> lift. lift pitch. So imagine this. Imagine you're, uh, you're working for a company. You're working for ILM or you're working for Sony Pictures or something. And you, you hop in the lift and on the ground floor and a producer hops in next to you. Okay, and you're going to the top floor, you're going to the fifth or sixth you've floor. You've got like 30 seconds. 20 seconds. Yeah, I see where this is going. I like yes. it. <laughs> you go, oh, hi there. Um, hey, I've got a great idea for a project. And, and the producer says, okay, what is it? You literally have 20 seconds to get it out. And, and if you can succinctly get an idea across in very, very uh, few words, that is a real skill. There's also something called a, a log line. Have you heard of a log line? No. Okay, that's cool. When you're, when you're, you know, when you're surfing Netflix and, you know, you think, oh, that looks interesting, so you click on it and you read the little blurb underneath it and it gives you a summary of the series? Yeah. That's a log line. So if you could say to somebody, uh, alcoholic detective returns to his hometown only to find... He is haunted by his past. That's a log line. And that conveys, you know, something, you know, you can flesh it out a bit more than, than that. Like on um, the back of a book? Kind of, but more succinct probably. Okay. Um, but very, very similar. And also for movies on movie posters and things like that. Uh, probably a different thing, but in script writing, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping that I'll, I'll get to teach the script writing uh, course of Simon Let's Be. Um, but uh, we'll be doing things like, uh, you know, writing a pitch, writing a log line, uh, you know, and uh, doing a synopsis and then doing a full script and all that sort of stuff. So it's all about storytelling. So really the first... I'm that excited. Cool, cool. Uh, the, the first step of, of a story is having an idea and the best way to get that idea across is to have something snappy and concise uh, to, to give somebody. And that's can I like ask the group about my particular... I can do it super quickly because I... Well, um, we're actually, I think I'm actually uh, already behind yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, cool. uh, Sarah? Uh, la, 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 la. No, I'm, it's, it's 7.41. Is it okay if we leave yeah. it? Yeah. yeah and then cool. we can ask questions at the end. I just want to yeah. get through this stuff really quickly. Yeah. Okay, so we'll come back to that at, at the end. I thought yeah. I'd be spending a lot more time doing this. Uh, da, 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 da. Now, is, uh, I'm just wondering, because on my screen, can you just see the PowerPoint and not all the little windows? I see your. So you just uh, see the PowerPoint, yeah. Pictures. Pictures okay, so you, you can't see me or any of the other dialogue boxes. I can't see your desktop. No. Okay. I'm just wondering because saying. part of my text is covered up by uh, the little windows that I've got in Zoom. So I'm just, I'm just going to be moving those around a bit so that I can just see. Oh, yeah. The, I can't see that. Only you can see those ones. Oh, really? Ooh. Okay. Fancy. Right out. Uh, let's get into it really quickly. Uh, the whole uh, production design. There's a lot of terms. There's uh, you know there's concept design, uh, uh, art direction. Uh, there's a lot of different terminology. Really, up until the the movie Gone with the Wind, there was no such thing as a production designer. It was just something that happened. You had an art director and you had a lot of carpenters, painters and people and set decorators working for you. And then eventually when it became a big deal that, you know, really uh, films were becoming so sophisticated that they weren't just being shot, they were being designed uh, right down to the, to the very staging of each shot. Of each shot, so that's when the uh, the role of uh, production designer was really first uh, came came to the fore. Now, the relationship be between production designer and art director usually means the production designer uh, sits above the art director. The production designer, oh, this is another example from Gone with the Wind. Uh, these these sketches, by the way. Um, Really quite simple, but they convey so much information. This scene was the burning of Alabama. Um, and, it, you know, it really conveys, even down to, to the image here where you can see the reflection in the, the fire in, the, in, the, in their eyes. 
um, and you know it, it is you know very very simple artwork in a way, but also very very evocative. And here as well, you've got you've got staging, you've got perspective, you've got colour styling. So much information comes across in these images. Um, the production designer works very closely with the director, and the art director would sit underneath, not physically, but you know, would be underneath in the hierarchy. Um, so the art director would be directly responsible to the production designer. This is talking about big productions. This is talking about you know major, um, major funding. Uh, we're not talking about little independent projects because that role tends to become the one person. Uh, the smaller that, that you get and the smaller the budget you get. So production designer, um, <clears throat> in essence, in summary, uh, responsible for the visual look of the project. So really, they're responsible for how, uh, how it looks in terms of, um, you know, keeping true to the story. So interpreting the, uh, the script in visual metaphors, that's a really important thing because we'll be looking at lots of examples where this happens. You've got to take a written... A written script and you're visualizing it for the very first time so you're the per you're the first person to see the film in a way before the audience even before the director because you're the first visual person to actually encounter the script um, so things like color choices uh, the, the time uh, in history where where it's set the sort of architecture that's there whether it's related like in this example from Hercules is obviously a, a nod to classical uh, Greek um, architecture. Can every, everybody see the same image? Just I'm just checking that you can see the. Um, yeah, the, uh, Greece. Cool. Yes. Yeah, it looks very greasy. Uh, you know, uh, Grecian, Grecian. Santorini. Santorini ish. <laughs> cool. <laughs> and also, you know, uh, the production design, designer is talking about uh, designing backgrounds and locations and things like that. Also, they'll be in charge of uh, character designs because all of these things work together to create. Uh, the final look and feel of the the project, and again, the uh, the production designer works very closely with the overarching director. So usually, like when we walked uh, worked on Balto, the overall director was um, Simon Wells. Uh, the uh, art director uh, was Richard Fordry, and I don't think there was a production designer. I think he was the production designer and art director. I don't think there was a separate production designer. So that was that was even on, on Balto. I could be wrong. One of the American animators may have also been a, a co-director, a co-art director. But you know, it's different on every project. I will say that you, we could teach you that this is the way that things work, and then your first job, you'll go, actually, this is completely different. Um, and that's just the way the industry is going. But generally, um, unless the one person is doing the same thing, the art director would be. Uh, directly talking to the production designer, the production designer talks to the, the overall director. Okay. So, um, the role of production designer, there's a little uh, YouTube clip in, in embedded in here that I just found today, which was quite inspiring because uh, this chap, Michael uh, Kurinsky from Sony, uh, talks about how he got into the industry and it's, it's, a, really, it's a really nice, inspiring story. So, I... I um, would urge you to have a look at that uh, when you get the chance. So he's a he's an actual production designer. Now this I love this woman Aurora Jimenez. She uh, went to college to study um, fine art, I think originally, and illustration, and then wanted to work in movies. So she did a filmmaking course, and then did art direction. So she's kind of kind of a, they call her a visual development artist now that's another role that could be a combination of um you know probably probably she would be responsible to an art director or she would be an art director herself but she would report directly to a a, a production designer i would say um she's very inspiring and i absolutely love her style i've got some uh, images here um so please check out pardon me these these links and um, you'll find the story is quite quite inspiring so this is some of her work um, I love this fat rubber cap. Um, and I also love the way that it's not a simple design, but it's a minimal design. Now, where we have a, a character that's based on shape, do you guys know what that's called? 
the way a character's built, no. made up. We call it the construction. You probably, you may have heard of that. So character construction is something that um, I'd love to talk to you about in depth. So this character is constructed, uh, sorry, constructed uh, on circles. Um, not just at the big level, but also at the smaller level as well. There's lots of circular, circular motifs in it. And that's carried right through. And that, that's a really lovely example of a very good designer. Uh, has anybody heard of the Book of Kells? The Secret of Kells, sorry. No. Uh, yes. Yes. <clears throat> Can you see that? I love the style of, of yes. that. I'm glad you mentioned that because I wanted to talk about the style. The style is minimal. It's a minimal style, which meant that the, uh, the designers and also the animators had to be very, very precise. It's actually quite hard sometimes to do something that is minimal and stylish and clean and reads well. Um, it's easier sometimes to do something that's really busy and has lots of detail on it and is kind of really sort of mesmerizing to the eye. There's something, a design that is clean and that reads well, by that I mean it tells the story in the best possible way. So that's something to think about as well. And we'll keep coming back to these sorts of things. But please, uh, yeah, check out this lady. She's very inspirational. And so you see, she works in so many different styles. She's incredibly talented. Um, these are some um, background designs. So not only, I mean, that's a sort of a double threat, someone who's really good at designing characters and really good at drawing backgrounds or designing backgrounds, how you draw is up to you. Um, by drawing, I do mean digital drawing, hand drawing, also 3D modeling. That's a form of drawing as far as I'm concerned. So it's all, it's all good. Uh, this is another style. I have a question. Yes, please, Brittany. Sorry, just really quickly. Um, so a lot of people have been saying that you need to like pick a, um like a, oh, what am I trying to say? You have to be like a specialist, not a generalist, sort of with your art form, I guess. So right. on the topic of being able to draw like characters and backgrounds, et cetera, et cetera, would you yeah. say that it's good to be able to do it all? I do. I do. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you why, because if I was to get an industry person to come in here and to give a, a, a guest lecture, they would say, you need to be a specialist. And the reason they, he or she would say that would be because in the job that they do, they are very specialised. And they're looking for people to do very specific jobs. So of course they want graduates who are specialised. But the reality of it is, you're beginning a journey where you're just finding out what your actual skill set is. So I would recommend that you try everything and you'll find out what you are good at and I will help you develop that. That's what we're here for. So I think there is an idea that by the end of the degree, you'll have an idea of where you think you might like to specialise, but it's good to have skills in everything because your first job, if you're offered a job doing backgrounds and you're a character person, you take it, you know, uh, yeah. just to put foot in the door. And then you go and talk to the character people. That's how I got into layouts uh, on Balto was just by going and, and, and badgering the, the, the head of layouts and saying, oh, you know, I'd love to do this. Can I, da, 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 you know, and eventually, the, you know, I got a, a test to do and, you know, I really enjoyed it. So I knew I wanted to do, to do layouts rather than just physical um, animation. So, yeah, that's a really relevant question. And it's one that is constantly argued. If you go onto a forum, uh, uh, sorry, a forum, <clears throat> Sorry, I'm getting a bit of um, uh, smoke inhalation. If you go into a forum, there's a constant argument between whether you should specialise or whether you should be a generalist. If you work for a small company, they will appreciate someone who has lots of skills in different areas. If you work for a big company, they might look for someone who just textures toenails. You, you never know. Or someone who just is good at wrangling data from motion capture or something like that. Or someone who's a technical light person um, you know who's just good at doing lighting in 3d and these are valuable jobs and you can get lots of money doing that sort of thing overseas but I think you need to start off as a gen as a generalist unless you already have a passion and a, and a certain talent in an area in which case I will see that and help you develop it does that help you it's a question yes it does thank you cool yeah okay we shall breathe on it Okay, so we'll, we'll come back to these concepts again, and I really uh, appreciate you asking questions. That's really good to hear. Um, 
as I say, when you go to smaller productions, you tend to find that the art director and the production designer is in fact the same person. Uh, they, will, they will do that. And then underneath these people, you will have um, someone who's good at doing characters, someone who, who's a, you know, a background artist, um, someone who's just good at doing animation. And then, then it tends to split out a bit more. Um, if, you, if you come out of uh, college and you've got a little film under your belt, and you've got a folio of artwork, um, you know, people will look at that and go, oh, I can see what you're good at. So in a way, if you, if you make the wrong choice too early, you may go down a bit of a rabbit hole and then say, oh, I really don't like this. And then you'll have to sort of go back and, and rediscover what you're really interested in and have to build up a new portfolio. So I think take it one step at a time, see what, what grabs your interest and, um, and yeah, just, just take, it, take it from there. But try, I, I think it's good to start as a generalist and then it seems natural then to specialise after you've got a, a grounding in, in everything. Okie dokie. So, yes, in smaller productions you find uh, you're doing a lot of, a lot of uh, different roles and I love working for smaller companies uh, because of that, uh, that thing and also the feeling that you're working like with a little family group. So it's like a little company... Um, that is working on a TV series or something like that. Um, it, it's, a, it's a pretty sweet thing. Um, uh, now, one of you, is it, Brittany, are you, are you from, uh, you're in Oxenford, is that right? Yeah. Okay. So are you familiar with um, Bluey, the animated TV series done up in Brisbane? Which one, sorry? Uh, a show called Bluey. No, I'm not. Okay. There's a studio up there uh, run by Go guy called Joe Brum, uh, and they're, they're, they're doing a TV series at the moment, which is shown on uh, ABC Kids or whatever, ABC Me or whatever it's called now. Um, it's called Bluey, and it's about a little blue cattle dog who lives in Brisbane. And it's so gone... Gang yeah, it's gone gangbusters. It's really, really popular. And there was an article, on, they had a, a, section, a thing on the news the other night about it. So, um, and that's, you know, that's a small, that's a small production. There's a small local production. Um, you know, I don't know if you're interested in 2D. Go ask to be an intern, Brittany. Sorry? Yeah, go, be, go be an intern. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. do it. Yeah. So, the, so what I'm saying is there are small companies around and there are big companies. You know, with, uh, with games as well, a lot of animators and visual effects people sometimes end up working in games. Um, and if you work for a big company, your job will be specialised. Uh, sometimes these big companies, you know, attract a lot of talent and then they fall over and they, they leave because they're overseas companies and they just decide it's not viable because the dollar fluctuated or someone, someone belched. Um, and then all of a sudden, everyone's out of work. But you'll, you'll be guaranteed that six months later, these little companies spring up, like little seedlings. And, I, and this is one of those instances. Uh, a lot of little games companies in Brisbane, uh, Chrome was one, for example, and they, they, got, a, they got a absolutely huge. Um, so, you know, there are opportunities there um, right across the spectrum. But again, I think with a, with a, you know, approaching a small studio, showing that you can do a number of things, I think is good, even though they might be looking for something very specific. I will tell you very briefly about... Um, uh, a very uh, a dear friend of mine who was an, an ex-student of mine who uh, uh, did uh, learn, he did animation with me, uh, he did a, a degree and I have to say he's probably one of the worst animators I've ever, ever seen <laughs> but he was incredibly um, good at communicating with people and he was a, a a brilliant team leader and he was just really good he, he, he got he got through and he produced a little a little actually worked on a game project uh, but he just had this knack for, for organization and uh, when it came time to uh, find internships for people um, I got him a like a production managers assistant internship and uh, this would have been about 15 I know this would have been about or oh, 10 years ago and uh, he's, he's now a, a you know, full-on production manager. And that was, his, that was his strong point. So he's still working in the industry, but he's just doing a different role. And it wasn't artwork. It was actually getting people to produce the artwork. And he was such a nice guy that uh, everyone loved him. You know, he just, and people would do things because he was a, a good 
manage it and he was a, he was just a good person so what i'm saying here is you never know what your speciality might be so uh, just keep an open open mind and, and see what happens to be the actual art director or production designer you, you would definitely have generalist skills wouldn't you as far I, as yeah. modeling animation texturing you'd have to sort of have a good base of most skills Yes, there are degrees you can do just in this, in being in art direction. You can do a whole degree in it. So to give you an idea of the scope of this subject, it's really an introduction, but it's really going to give you, you know, all the information that I possibly can about these, these roles. Yeah. Um, yes, I think not only just uh, being a generalist in terms of your skills, but also being able to take uh, inspiration and... Uh, and, and, and use anything for reference and being very adaptable. Uh, but really, also, you've got to keep in mind the thing that we talked about before as well, about remaining true to the original story. So really, you're still a gun for hire. You're not, unless you're making your own film, you're going to be hired to realise somebody else's idea. And that will be, you know, the, the, the script writer or whoever came up with the idea will be in charge of that. So... This is a very good point. If you're, if you're locked into one style, you won't be able to adapt if someone says, we're doing a kid's show, and you're like, oh, no, I want to work on something like games, Game of Thrones. Um, you don't. You just, you just change. And that's why some of the artists that I was showing you um, work in many different styles and can actually turn their, their hand to many different things. So I think it's, it, it's, a, it's a sort of a, it's a weird balancing act, the you know, between being a generalist and a, and a specialist. Yeah. Ideally, you should be both, which makes no sense. Well, yeah, I, I totally get that. Because I want to create my own studio, my own company, making games cool. in virtual reality, so. Cool, cool. I am so, basically yeah. am a generalist. In, I, want to be, I want to be able to do everything, every part of it, even though I'll have other people. Eventually. Exactly. And, and one of your skills that you will develop will be knowing the right people. Yeah. Uh, knowing that the skills that you don't have is is just as important as knowing the skills that you do have. Yeah. So you'll go, look, I'm really weak on on you know uh, budgeting and and you know business management. So I need someone to help me with that. So I concentrate on the creative side of it. Yeah. Or you might want to be you know a business person who actually goes out and finds projects for your company, um, and yeah. then you you still get to hire and fire your, your production designer or, or no, whatever. I'll get someone else for that. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd advise that. Okay, and, and, and I'll just move on because we're, yeah. we've got a few more Sorry. slides to go through and I don't want, I don't want to keep you all night. Um, just, uh, just wanted to touch on drawing because I'm, I'm a bit of a drawing nut. I love it. Um, I encourage you to do it. Um, I encourage you all to keep a visual diary if you possibly can. If you don't already, um, I use things like little notebooks like this little moleskin notebook. And I just do random drawings and stuff. Just all sorts of crazy, crazy things. Drawing is my whole life. Good. That's, that's what I like to hear. So, and the reason drawing is so valuable. Now, I'll sort of qualify this whole thing I'm about to say by saying I used to work with an art director in a games company who could not draw. And he was the art director. And he said, and he, and he admitted, I... I can't draw, but if you gave him a 32 by 32 pixel um, uh, texture, he could painstakingly make something look like anything he wanted to. He just had that talent. So I see that as a form of drawing, even though he didn't really recognize it. It's really using the same muscles in your brain, I think. But the thing is, drawing will teach you a lot of things that you would have to learn in a different way. Um, and I think drawing is a shortcut to becoming fluent in seeing. Uh, drawing is actually a way of seeing, I believe, and it's also a, a way of researching. Um, there are so many different ways to draw. Uh, it's, it's I've got so many drawing books around me, we don't have time to, to go through them, but I will maybe talk about a different book each week or something. Uh, so just, a, a, you know, drawing teaches you how to see, it teaches you perspective, staging, anatomy, Please, 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 if you can join a life drawing group, I know you've got a lot on, but you'll find it very enjoying and relaxing as well as slightly frustrating, but it's probably the best thing you can do as an animator 
as an artist is to do life drawing, do a life drawing class. I, I, I really, really recommend that. And that advice was given to me by a chap called Peter Visca, uh, um, oh, no, sorry, uh, Peter Lushwitz in Sydney. Peter Visca is another guy in Melbourne. Um, and he said to me when I was first starting out in animation, um, I went to him for a job. He said, no. He said, you've got potential, do life drawing. And so I did. So I really strongly recommend that. Uh, so that will teach you anatomy. Once you know anatomy, character design becomes so much more easy. Uh, drawing will teach you environment d design, um, drawing landscapes, uh, you know, uh, even looking at something that you like and reproducing it is fine as long as you reference that, as long as you don't try to pass that off as your own work, it's fully okay to copy things because that's how you learn, okay? You just don't pass it off as your own work. Um, using tones, so just the use of black and white to create mood in an image is something that is so much easier to do with drawing than in, than in 3D, for example, and, and with lights or something like that. Um, so composition, like the little sketch I showed you for Gone With The Wind, and also, we're going to do a bit of um, stuff, uh, you know, bashing out ideas quickly, called thumbnailing. Uh, are you guys familiar with the term thumbnailing? Uh, yes. yes. Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, that's something that I, I really um, strongly uh, advise you to do. It, it just means that you make your mistakes at a small size and you don't waste a lot of time uh, you know, generating ideas and throwing them away. So if you do them really small, you can work with silhouettes. There's lots of different ways of thumbnailing. We'll go into this in a, a lot more depth. But drawing is absolutely um, a skill that will never hurt you. It will only ever make your work better. Um, even though some people don't feel that they're good at drawing. If you basically, I always say to my students, if you can sign your name, you can draw. And you probably drew when you were a kid and someone told you that it wasn't, that tree didn't look right or whatever and you stopped doing it. Um, I encourage you to pick up a pencil. Um, and that's not just because, you know, I used to work in 2D. It's because I continue to do it and it's so rewarding. And it, it actually, going back to life drawing, if you do life drawing, every other type of drawing that you do will improve. Even if you're doing really abstract things or if you're doing really stylized characters, the life drawing will help you. And it's, it's a weird thing, but it just, it just works. Okay, so here's some examples of some lovely drawings. Um, oh, I've just forgotten his name. Uh, he was a um, art director. He was like a, a sort of a sub, well, I think he might have been head of backgrounds on Balto. So these are, these are some just tonal, what we call tonal sketches, um, showing the, the alleyways in uh, Nome, Alaska, where the, where the film was set. And um, they're very evocative. Um, if you look at them, they actually tell, they give you a lot of information with very little actual um, or very few elements. So just by the use of space, um, directing the eye, really great use of perspective. Um, and the thing is with, with background design is that you've always got to leave something out. When you look at a background from animation, it should always look as though something's missing because the characters aren't. So the, the, the background designs are specifically created to have action over the top of them. Um, that's something that we'll, we'll talk about uh, further as well. Um, so here's some Pixar sketches of, of characters. Just notice the difference, um, the simplicity, again, coming back to the, the simple shapes. Characters that are based on simple shapes tend to be, I think, a lot more appealing than complex characters, unless you get it just right. And this is a lovely Disney sketch. Um, I put this one in here just because it had that lovely little bit of that, the plant there in the foreground, which immediately... Is that like you, from The Lion King? I, you are dead right. Well spotted. Yes. Wow, what a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I love that movie. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. So, yeah, that, that element, that dark element in the front immediately pushes everything into the background. So, immediately you've got the sense of space, you've got the perspective happening, and it just, uh, using, using foreground elements, putting something dark in the foreground immediately pushes everything behind. These are things that we'll continue to uh, talk about as we, as we look at images. Okay, so this is another one. What's this one from? 
How to Train Your Dragon. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, uh, is it? Oh, yeah, yeah it is too. Oh, no, the, yeah, I can see the characters. Yeah, yeah. I only just, I just noticed the dragon, uh, the characters. It's, it's so, it looks like a Roger Dean painting. <laughs> There's a bit of Avatar in there too, maybe. Um, but yeah, this is, this is a digital uh, painting, obviously, a digital drawing painting, whatever you want to call it. Obviously, there have been live, well, probably pictures of things from something like the Giant's Causeway. Um, I think that's in, in Scotland or Ireland. I can't remember now. Uh, those basalt columns, you know, looking at nature reference. Someone's actually looked at something in nature and gone, I can use this in here as an almost sort of photographic uh, element, which they've, they've brought into the image really well, embedded it in. That's a technique that you can use in, in, uh, with concepting. And this, this is a really good example of it. Again, a dark foreground element pulls it towards the viewer and pushes everything else back. Uh, so you get that really big sense of there's a big space there. And you'd have a totally different feeling if you didn't have that element at the bottom and that stuff coming in from the top right hand corner. So these are things that you, you'll gradually be able to sort of uh, pick up. Now, the beast. This is a very loose drawing by Glenn Keane, uh, quite a famous Disney animator. And I reckon he would have bashed this out in probably about 10 seconds, 10 or 15 seconds. Really, really quick drawing, but it has weight. Uh, how do you draw weight? I mean, that's, that's sort of an almost impossible concept to, uh, to rationalise. But when you, when you do life drawing and you, you're drawing the human body, it happens automatically. And then you start drawing characters and you start to bring those elements across into your character design. And, and this guy, I tell you what, he does the most amazing life drawings. And if you look at... Uh, and I encourage you to look at interviews with um, artists that you like and find out more about them and see if you can find out what um, they do to make their work better. That's always a very, very good thing to do. Here's another really good uh, example showing you how um, these, these scenes on the left-hand side and you can see on the right that they've been broken down into their basic, basic elements. And uh, again, it's all about telling the story, leading the eye. It's very, very clear what you're supposed to be looking at, what is the focal point. It's, all, it's, it's clear visual communication. This is pure storytelling. So even if you're only looking at the images on the right, in both, uh, the, sorry, the, the, sorry, the, the right-hand one and then the left-hand one on the right-hand side, if you know what I mean, even if you're only looking at those images, you would still get you know, a fair bit of the story um, without looking at the, the, um, the finished artwork. Um, so that's, that's, um, that's something that we'll, we'll come back to as well. I was going to, yeah, I just need to speed through this a little bit. Oh, well, we're, we're pretty much new there. What I've done here is I've just given you some resources to have a look at. Um, the Australian Production Design Guild, um, French production designers, I just love French design. Um, have a look at uh, scene on set and pushing pixels. Just check these out. A lot of these, these websites have productions that are um, they're live action a lot of them are live pure live action but with a lot of effects in them so if you're interested in, in the visual effects side of things um, really good to have a look at and also I think it's good to reference live action when you're designing for animation so for example someone says to you okay we're going to do this thing it's um, it's going to be in the 50s so immediately you go and you look at your know, 50s furniture you know you look at mad men and have a look at how their production design works. And then you can use some of those elements in your, in your backgrounds, for example, uh, for your animated project. So everything is a potential resource. Everything's a potential source of inspiration. And, and don't, don't limit yourself with that, okay? Arigato, au revoir. Um, I put this in here because uh, there's a little story behind it. Um, a lot of these things triggered uh, stories when um, my wife and I whenever we go overseas we automatically go to um, the, the street where all the comic book shops are the, the, the streets that sell um, you know have you know posters and art galleries and uh, the French are absolutely crazy for anime and so we'd go into these little comic book shops and start talking to the guys behind the counter and say, oh, look, we're animation teachers. You know, we're into this and that. And they're like, oh, they get really excited. And one day we're in this, this shop in Paris and uh, someone left the room and they went, arigato, au revoir. And I just thought, 
that is such a beautiful summary of how inclusive animation is. You've got uh, thank you in Japanese, goodbye in French. Uh, Japanese animation and French animation uh, are two things I really uh, love looking at. And um, yeah, so that, that's uh, uh, just a little little anecdote for you. So that's that's pretty much that's pretty much it for this. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing. Now, do you guys have some questions to us that might be helpful for um, uh, to have on, on the recording before I stop recording? I can't think of anything at the moment. Yeah, your brain's no, probably full. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no right. So I'm just gonna stop the recording if I can yep. find the appropriate button. Uh, let's see, pause, stop.